With the presence of American aircraft carriers in the region, and the swift destruction of the light carrier Shoho on the morning of May 7th, 1942, Admiral Inouye, commander of Task Force MO, has decided to turn the MO invasion force north until the American carriers are eliminated. For Vice Admiral Takagi and Rear Admiral Hara, commanding the carrier striking force, it's obvious from the number of aircraft used to sink the Shoho that two American carriers are in the region. These two carriers must be quickly eliminated if Operation MO is to succeed. Therefore, Rear Admiral Hara chooses to gamble and at 4.15pm launches a strike of 12 VAL dive bombers and 15 Kate torpedo bombers 280 miles west in an effort to find and attack the American carriers. The strike could potentially prove highly successful, but many of the Japanese pilots are tired after the strike on the Neosho and Sims and now face a dangerous mission which will end with a tired landing back on their carriers. The Japanese aircraft fly the 280 miles west but are unable to find Task Force 17 through the heavy cloud cover. They release their ordnance and hope to make it back to their carrier safely. But little do they know, they have been detected by American radar and Wildcat fighters are now being guided in to intercept them. The Wildcats, who have positioned themselves behind the formation of Japanese aircraft, strike out of the setting sun and shoot down a Val and six of the Kates for the loss of three of the attacking Wildcats. Flying through the dark and sighting carriers ahead, some of the Japanese aircraft even try to land on the American carriers. As a Japanese aircraft attempts to land on the Yorktown, the pilot finally realises his mistake and hastily aborts the approach. The US warships open fire, shooting down a further aircraft. With 9 of the 27 Japanese shot down, their mission is a costly failure. With this encounter, and with the Japanese airmen reporting the position of Task Force 17 on their arrival back to their carriers, it is now clear to both sides just how close they actually are to one another. After days of searching for one another, the atmosphere in both fleets is thick with tension, both knowing that the following day will see the climax of the battle. The following morning of May the 8th, at 6.15am, seven Kates launched from the Japanese carrier striking force in search of the American carriers. In turn, 20 minutes later, 18 Dauntless SBD dive bombers launch a 360 degree search from Task Force 17. At around 8.20am, both American and Japanese aircraft find what they're looking for and simultaneously issue reports identifying the location of their enemy's carriers. Crucially, the bad weather that had been shielding the American carriers has now moved north to cover the Japanese carriers. The Americans are first to launch a full strike. At 9.25am, 15 Wildcat fighters, 39 Dauntless SBD dive bombers and 21 Devastator TBD torpedo bombers rumble into the air and head out towards the Japanese carriers. At the same time, the Japanese have launched their strike. 18 Zero fighters, 33 VAL dive bombers and 18 Kate torpedo bombers are in the air and heading for Task Force 17. As the American aircraft head for the carrier striking force, Lieutenant Commander Dixon, the commanding officer of Scouting Formation 2 from the Lexington, has left his assigned scouting path and flown towards the location of where the carrier striking force has been sighted. On reaching its reported location, heavy rain initially hides it from Dixon's view, but through a break in the rain cloud he finally spots it. Dixon shadows, guiding the American strike onto the Japanese carriers by continually correcting the force's reported course, while Japanese Zeros flying combat air patrol move in to engage him. He flies evasively through the heavy cloud, maintaining contact with the carrier striking force over two hours, continually updating the course of the Japanese carriers to Task Force 17 while being hunted down by the prowling Zeros. At 10.32am, aircraft from the Yorktown locate the Japanese carriers, but instead of making an immediate attack, the commander of Yorktown's Dauntless dive bombers decides to wait 20 minutes for Yorktown's Devastator torpedo bombers to arrive, so as to ensure they coordinate their attack on the Japanese carriers. However, the wait allows the Japanese time to launch more Zeros, with the arrival of Yorktown's TBDs, Yorktown's aircraft finally begin their anvil attack on the still visible Shikaku, encountering only light anti-aircraft fire. Trailing a mile behind the Zuikaku, Shikaku's only escorts are the cruisers Furutaka and Kinugaza, sailing astern of the large Japanese carrier. As the seven SBDs dive on her, their bombsights once again fog up as they had at Tulagi, and all seven aircraft miss. Harried by Zeros, the 17 SBDs of VB-5 then launch their attack. As they power into their dives on the tightly turning Shikaku, 
Their bomb sights also fog up, but they press home their attack, and an SBD strikes her bow with a £1,000 bomb. As Lieutenant John J. Powers dives, the wing of his SBD is struck by a 20mm round from a zero, but Powers pushes on, releasing his bomb at just 1,000 feet. Unable to pull up, Powers and his rear seat gunner are consumed by the massive explosion of their £1,000 bomb ripping through the carrier. For sacrificing his life to ensure the accuracy of his bomb, Powers is posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. With multiple large fires aboard, Shikaku is now attacked by VT-5's nine Devastators, but they launch their torpedoes at too great a distance to be effective, and Shikaku evades. Shortly after, with many aircraft lost in the bad weather, some of Lexington's aircraft finally find Shikaku and launch their own attack. Only four of Lexington's Dauntlesses actually attack Shikaku, scoring another £1,000 bomb hit on the burning carrier. Eleven of Lexington's Devastators now move into attack. They launch their torpedoes and pull out of their attack run, believing a number of their torpedoes have struck true. But once again, Shikaku evades all eleven torpedoes launched towards her. By the time the American aircraft depart the area, Shikaku is severely damaged and cannot conduct flight operations as her damage control teams work to suppress her raging fires. 108 of Shikaku's sailors have been killed, and she is forced to withdraw from the area. However, with her watertight integrity intact, she is at no risk of sinking as she steams for home. American losses are light, at three Wildcats and two Dauntlesses lost, for two Zeros shot down. At almost the same time as Yorktown's aircraft began their attack on the Shikaku, the Japanese prepare to begin their own attack. Having been detected by radar 68 miles out, nine Wildcats have been scrambled to intercept them, but failed to make the interception as they approach Task Force 17. As the Japanese strike closes in, the Kate split into two groups in order to attack the American carriers from different directions. In comparison to the American attack, the Japanese attack is much swifter, but becomes subject to much heavier anti-aircraft fire. Zeros and Wildcats tangle with one another in the skies above Task Force 17 as the strike aircraft move in. The first to attack are the 18 Kate torpedo bombers, with 14 targeting the Lexington and only two targeting the Yorktown. Four are shot down on their attack run. Three Kates drop their torpedoes against Yorktown, but all miss. With Kates coming at her from either side, the unwieldy Lexington is able to manoeuvre enough to avoid the first five torpedoes, even letting two of the torpedoes pass right by her on either side. But her crew's luck runs out, and Lexington is finally hit by two torpedoes on her port side. One causes flooding, whilst the other will cause an ultimately mortal wound, jamming her elevators and cutting small ruptures in her port aviation fuel tank that progressively fills the ship with gasoline vapour. Just minutes later, 19 valves from the Shikaku dive on the Lexington under intense anti-aircraft fire, and with Wildcats desperately trying to defend their carrier. Despite only one vowel shot down on the attack run, they only secured two 550-pound bomb hits, causing no critical damage to the carrier. Fourteen vowels from Zuikaku are the next to make their attack in an attempt to hit the sharply manoeuvring Yorktown. Again under AA fire, and with two Wildcats harassing, the vowels are only able to score a single 550-pound bomb hit on the carrier, this time causing structural damage. The fires are brought under control, and Yorktown soldiers on. Eight US aircraft have been shot down, and 13 Japanese, with a further 19 rendered irreparable. By the afternoon, it is clear that the battle has been very costly for both carrier forces, and that neither side is in any position to launch another substantial strike. Aboard the Lexington, the situation is deteriorating. At 12.47pm, the forward section of the carrier is shaken by a large explosion, with aviation fuel vapour spreading uncontrollably throughout the vessel as the afternoon goes on, she is severely shaken by two more huge explosions. Despite the best efforts of her damage control parties, the fires cannot be controlled and abandoned ship is ordered. The venerable carrier is finally scuttled by torpedoes from an escorting destroyer. Upon being informed of the damage to the Shikaku and the air groups of the Zurikaku, and with the route to Port Moresby still blocked by Rear Admiral Crace's cruisers, Admiral Inouye calls off the operation. Aware the MO invasion force has turned north, and having already lost one of the US Navy's few aircraft carriers, Fletcher cannot jeopardise the safety of the Yorktown, and decides to move Task Force 17 south so she can be repaired. Whilst the Japanese remain in the area for a few days hoping to re-engage the Americans, 
they realize the chance has gone and leave the area. At the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Imperial Japanese Navy has lost the light carrier Shoho, a destroyer, and a few auxiliary ships at Tulagi. The United States Navy loses the fleet carrier Lexington, Euler Neosho, and a destroyer. Both sides claim victory. By tonnage of ships sunk, the battle is a tactical victory for the Japanese, but by stopping the Japanese capture of Port Moresby, the Battle of the Coral Sea is a strategic victory for the Allies. The Japanese will now be forced to try and take Port Moresby by land over the Owen Stanley Mountains via the Kokoda Trail, where they will be ultimately stopped by predominantly Australian forces. Task Force 17 has inflicted enough damage to the Shikaku and to the air groups of the Zuikaku to ensure that neither carrier will be able to participate in the Battle of Midway in a few weeks' time, a potentially pivotal factor in its outcome.